So, it's great to be here, and I've heard a lot of great words here that I think make me even more so excited to be here, and I'm going to quote Fernando from his talk earlier, that data science is a critical skill for a citizen of the modern world to learn. Number two, words that I've heard that, was, that were really critical were empowerment, democratization, and which is precisely what this talk is going to be about. So, how did I come to this or to be part of this community? 2001, kind of like Wes, this is where I started getting introduced to the IPython world, and for very, very practical, self-empowering reasons, which were the following. I had just finished a very, very theoretical PhD and was interested in developing more practical skills that I could apply in the real world, and particularly, I wanted to apply some of my thesis work to the analysis of sports and NBA data. Well, guess what? Back then, this is not something you could do with languages such as MATLAB. So I was super excited when I wrote my first scraper using mechanized and beautiful soup. And I was literally like, wow, you can actually do this? So that's when a mission began to, as an educator, how can I empower my students, especially students that are not traditionally computer science students, to develop an interest in data, computer programming, but with the important caveat that it is critical to learning, and education research shows this, it is critical to learning to develop these interests in coding and data in the context of applications that interest the students themselves. And I'll go to an example in this talk that shows that. So the why part, I shouldn't have to convince this audience why. The how, let me tell you. So what did I specifically do when I started my position as an assistant professor at Harvard? Well, I designed two courses. My discipline in training is signal processing, theoretical signal processing. And traditionally, if you think about electrical engineering, or at least this is how we think about ourselves and computer scientists, there's been this divide in terms of how electrical engineering taught and programming is taught. So this is why in a lot of departments, you will have ECE departments, as opposed to electrical engineering and computer science departments. And I was interested in bringing signal processing and theory and coding and applications within the confines of one class. Now, here's an important challenge that is backed up by education research, which is that when, in the context of a given class, you're trying to teach multiple concepts that are challenging in themselves, so theory, as well as coding and data science, there's a certain amount of cognitive load that prevents the students to learn optimally. And this is a cognitive load that I realized when I started getting into this IPython, Jupyter world. So what I thought would be great to do would be to design a platform that allows students not to have to worry about setting up their coding environments. A lot of the people in the audience here are very seasoned computer scientists who've been working at this from a very early age, so it comes naturally to them to have to set up an Ubuntu box with the right dependencies and so forth. Picture an undergrad who has never touched a machine before. This is something that leads to a certain amount of anxiety that I've actually seen. So, how do you build courses that bridge this gap between teaching theory, programming, and applications to data while providing a seamless platform that the students can plug into and focus on learning the actual content of the course as opposed to having to set up a programming environment? And one quick way to summarize it was in a dinner conversation that I had with one of my undergrads when I told her where this class came from, and she literally said, so what you're telling me is that you've designed the course that you would have liked to take. And that's precisely what I did. So this is about empowering the next generation of electrical engineers, or whatever your discipline is. How do you empower these people to get into programming, analysis of data? So let me talk briefly about what these two courses are. So these courses, it's two courses, Engineering Sciences 155 and Engineering Sciences 201. On my slides, I don't have the official names. I have what I like to call these courses. The official names are, for Engineering Science 155, is Biomedical Signal Processing. And what I like to call this course is the Labs in the Wild course. And for those of you that are from the 90s, you will recognize a parallel with a Spike Lee movie here in the name of the course. Uh, what are the topics that this course covers? So I'm, a, I'm trained in signal processing, so signals and systems, Fourier transforms, convolutions, how do you design filters, how do you process time series. There's also some basic probability. So over here already you see that there's a certain amount of theory that the students need to be comfortable learning, right? What is the goal of the course? From my perspective, is to empower them to take 
this theory that is traditionally taught in these courses and make it more palpable and more real to them. How do we do this? Well, we give them this, what I call the Mercedes-Benz of wearables, it's the Empatica E4. So this is a device to put it in perspective that costs about $1,000. And this is a device that has four sensors in them, a temperature sensor, an electrical dermal response, so a skin conductance sensor, accelerometers, and the last sensor that it has is one that is able to essentially measure your heart rate. So what do I mean by full vertical integration? So within the confine of the course, I want the students to be able to do the following. I want them to A, be able to collect data on themselves. I want this to be highly personalized. In other words, I'm going to teach you all of this theory and data science on how to process the data, but at the end of the day, I want the questions that are going to be driving the applications you're going to build to come from your own interests. And I will show you examples of projects where the students actually precisely did that. So this full ver vertical integration where the students go from collecting data on themselves, uploading them on the cloud, and processing it in the Jupyter Notebook, and in the context of some interesting projects that I'll show you, actually following through with taking the output of their applications and making real-time decisions with them in an Internet of Things kind of way. So the second course is a graduate course, and this, this, this is a course that, uh, that, I, that, I, that I, I'm really glad I developed and that I'm really proud of. So the official title of the course is Decision Theory. The less official title of the course is what I call Rigorous Data Science. So what's very interesting about uh, our program at the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard, and I think this is becoming true of a lot of programs and a lot of things that young people want to learn now in engineering disciplines is that the boundary between people that do theory and want to process data and coding has become very, very fuzzy. And one of the key philosophies in my class, not the one mentioned here, I'll go through this one in a second, but one of the key philosophies, because I get computer science students, I get applied math students, I get bioengineers, I get pure math students, but one of the things that I wanted to do in this class is that you're not going to get, a, you're not going to get away in my class by just knowing a lot of theory or just knowing how to code. That there is a balance in between that I want you to learn, and I'm going to design the course in such a way. So you get the usual suspects in terms of topics, regression, classification, optimization, and numerics. We prove theorems in the course. And my goal is essentially to get the students to understand, at a very deep level, these machine learning algorithms, these statistical inference algorithms that you're going to be using, at a very, very deep level, what's happening inside, but at the same time, to use this understanding right, to be able to process data and do applications. So for this particular class, in the context of the problem sets, there's a mix of theory and real-world data processing. So applications from sports data that I mentioned earlier, so tracking dynamic performance of sports, Twitter data. In particular, we, we, we had a very, very nice assignment where we analyzed some of the tweeting patterns of the PR firm that used to be behind uh, President Obama's uh, Twitter account and saw some interesting things that unfortunately I can't show you here. We process geyser data from uh, Old Faithful and uh, neural data. This is one of the applications that I work with. And one important thing here is that when it came to final projects, I wanted students, and this is not typical if you come from this world that I do, from this academic world, I wanted the students to go from question formulation, this is the question that I'm interested in answering, data gathering, so scraping, go find the data, go clean it up, right? And complete this with an analysis in the Jupyter Notebook. In other words, I wanted to teach these kids not only theory, but things that they would actually be able to use right away were they to get a job in a data science context. So how did we do this? I'm going to talk briefly about the platform that we've developed at Harvard to accomplish this and to make the scale for a lot of students. And uh, the engineer that primarily worked on this is Faraz Sadiq, who gave a poster about this yesterday and should be somewhere in the audience. I'll ask him to raise his hand at the end of the talk. So, Again, something I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the education research shows that when you're trying to sh teach multiple things that have high cognitive load in and of themselves, right, it makes learning harder. So the idea was that we're going to put together this platform that abstracts away from the students how the Jupyter Notebooks are served and having to set up their environment. And from our perspective, this is very selfish as well. This means that I or my teaching fellows don't have to deal with figuring out the machines for 30 or 40 different undergrads. 
And when it comes to our data science courses that have 100 to 200 students, we don't want to be sitting there with 200 students and figuring out their dependencies, basically. So, and the, what this picture shows essentially is how do you make this more palatable and how do you create a sandbox environment? And I'm going to make a comment here, I think, which uh, the traditional CS folks here in the audience will, this will resonate with them. I'm not suggesting this, so the building of environments that make things seamless for users as a long-term solution. And in fact, what we've seen in the course is that once we give them the sandbox environment and the students build this confidence, very quickly they stop using our platform, actually, and actually get this confidence to do it on their own and understand how to set up the environment and so forth. So how did we do this? So the first version of this was in the fall of 2016, right when I began my job as a faculty. Uh, bad, bad idea, bad thing to do, and I don't advise it when you're starting your junior faculty job. But this is something I was excited about anyway, so I went ahead and did it. So, the first, and I can't do this justice, so I'm going to go quickly through it. In the first installment, this was motivated, and you should give credit where credit is due, by some of the work by the Berkeley folks, specifically a blog post that I read by Jess Hamrick that discussed what she went through to design a system to teach Jupyter Notebook. Very briefly, we had an Amazon machine where multiple users, in this particular case 15 students, had Docker containers. And you can clearly understand how this does not scale well to multiple classes. So that's the system that, in your case, is on the left-hand side. And at the moment, the deployment we have is one that scales very well. And in this particular case, we have an Amazon cluster manager that automatically spins up different AWS instances on the fly for students and automatically figures out when the machine is not being used. What this does is that it allows us to save on cost tremendously, as I'll show you in the next slide. So comparing the two setups here very briefly, so I'm just going to go through the numbers here and the cost in particular. It costs about $3 per student for 30 hours of use per week in our new setup. So let's think about this for a second. This is cheaper than your fancy Starbucks latte, <laughs> right? For $30 per week of usage, right? So I want to go through a quick example of a project that shows this philosophy, in my opinion. And so the student's name is Ryan Hovison. He just graduated and went over to med school. Unfortunately, I would have loved to keep him as a PhD student. And yes, he is that big. This is not an optical illusion. So <laughs> Ryan was on the football team, right? And Ryan took my engineering science 155 class not knowing how to code at all. He did a project that was about whether you could use this device that we gave him to predict the outcome of a basketball shot. Now again, so this goes back to a statement I made earlier about how it is important to connect the learning to the interest of the students. And what did Ryan do? Ryan took the class, did a project, he was just learning things and there, here and there, but went on to do an undergrad thesis with me where he built a system from front to end. And I'm talking about hardware, to coding up the machine learning algorithm in hardware, and designing an algorithm that essentially sewing together by hand the sensors on a sleeve that you could wear. And you take a basketball shot. Before the shot goes in, it would give you it, its best guess as to whether the shot would go in or not. I mean, this is tremendous, in my opinion. And that's why I'm excited with these kind of technologies. So to give you other examples of projects here and how creative students get when you put these tools in their hands, we had, students about, we had projects about student stress monitoring. Some of the undergrads were interested in, hey, can we use this device and the accelerometers or heart rate data in there to figure out how stressed are we as undergrads? Uh, on the grad student level, I had somebody build a fantasy football team recommender from front to end, scrape the data, use mechanized and beautiful soups that I love, by the way, build his recommender, and is actually now using it in his fantasy football team. I had a very nice project about modeling the wolverine density in Norway. This is something the Scandinavians think a lot about. So wolverine sightings. And it turns out that it's a very interesting machine learning and actually data gathering problem as well. So as far as course management is concerned, I'm going to breeze through this real quick. The nice thing about this ecosystem is that now we're doing everything on the cloud. So what we have access to are Bitbucket teams, essentially. Right? So we have a team for the course, in this particular case, ES155, and different tracks that allow us to deal with coursework management, 
delivering of assignments and labs to the students as well as course material, and the students have different level of access to this content. One of the things we haven't figured out yet is automatic grading, and it's something that I would love to talk to some of the folks in the room about, particularly because, as I mentioned in our case, we're not just grading code, we're also grading theoretical assignments and so forth. So the why, again, the only reason why I did this is I wanted to build courses that I would have loved to take as an undergrad. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very empowering for me to see how well the students uh, resonate with these particular ideas. So, so to conclude, and this echoes uh, Fernando's statement. Uh, so I knew about Fernando. I've known about Fernando for about 10 years. I had never met him before. So it's, it's very interesting that we've developed similar attitudes towards what it means to do data science, what it means to do science, and so forth. I mean, I do believe that in the future, so the ability to facility with data manipulation is going to be part of literacy. I, this is something that I do believe, and I think one of the things that this community can do, right, and that it is, it is already doing, I mean, case in point, all of the talks we've seen this morning, right, is that it is developing these tools that empower people outside of the mainstream to actually take advantage of these tools. So as an example, I'm partnering with uh, the Boston Public School Systems to see how we can use deployments of Jupyter Hub on the cloud to teach data science in an underserved community. And for a very, very simple reason. Wealth of data are available out there about communities. How do you now empower the communities to plug into those data sets, right? To make, to make informed decisions based on data about things that will affect their quality of life, right? And as far as the potential impact on education, I've already talked about this. I mean, I would love to see the day where in most universities, undergrads come in, everybody comes in with an email address and an account that is cloud-based where they have access to a Jupyter notebook, whether you're a government major, whether you're a philosophy major, and that this is part of your education from the time you begin to the time you graduate. So the key lessons that I've learned here is essentially that given these tools, the students just want to be left alone. I mean, I was very saddened by the fact that after the students got facility with the platform, I would barely see anybody at my, at my office hours. <laughs> and it's, it's very, <laughs> it's very, very, it was, but, but, but they ended up doing great work. And I want to close, I would have loved to do a demo, but I'm running out of time, unfortunately. I want to close by thanking the people that uh, made this happen. In particular, Faraz Sadiq that I mentioned, who was the engineer behind our own deployment. And uh, as I mentioned, we've taken note of how Berkeley does things, and a lot of other people do things online. So the other people that I want to acknowledge here, and I think this is very, very important, is uh, the lady on the left, Diana Zhang. She's my grad student. She's a CS PhD student. She's my first grad student. And I was a stressed faculty starting my first course. She was a data science student. She was excited about this. And together, we build this framework as to how to excite the student. And Jim Waldo, who runs the uh, academic computing at SEAS, for believing in this vision that we've deployed. And thank you for your attention. And again, I'm excited to be here. <laughs>